This discussion that we're turning to now will consider how allies and partners can reorient themselves to operate effectively in the information domain while also adhering to democratic norms and values. I'm pleased to introduce Kate Brannon, who serves as the editorial director at Just Security for this conversation. Graham, thanks so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to host this important conversation. And we're joined uh, today by Commander Mick Ryan of the Australian Defense College. And he's also an adjunct scholar at the Modern War Institute at West Point. And we're also joined by Emerson T. Brooking, a senior fellow at the DFRL lab um, at the Atlantic Council. And uh, Emerson also wrote a fantastic book on exactly this topic like war, the weaponization of social media. So I'm thrilled to, to talk to you both today about this. Um, I thought I'd start with Emerson um, to sort of help frame the, the, the conversation that we're gonna have. Are there a few examples that you could give us that kind of bring the challenge to life, um, whether from you know, recent headlines or going back a few years, um, just to help folks listening really get their imagination around what, what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, Kate, thank you, and uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, if we consider examples to frame this challenge, we really don't have to look very far. If we just look to um, uh, headlines in the last few days um, regarding the transit of a British naval vessel through the Black Sea uh, to contradictory headlines uh, to a apparently spoofed um, open source data, which seems to have misrepresented a, a vessel's position, uh, to Russian claims that, that bombs were used um, as sorts of uh, warning shots as uh, a British warship came perilously close to Russian-occupied Crimea, um, but then to conflicting video evidence that no such bombs were dropped and no such actions were taken. Uh, it seems more and more apparent that the sorts of information manipulation, which we often uh, study in the context of elections, is now being used in these sorts of military confrontations or um, to utilize, um, to, to, to basically wage a, a narrative warfare in which the fact and reality of a particular confrontation matter much less than the um, perceptions of it. And for um, military commanders and officers, um, this could be, this is a particularly difficult challenge um, because it, it places, you know, a military exercise or a military transit or maneuver uh, much closer into the realm of politics. And conflict is always political. Um, uh, warfare is always a political competition. But the fact that um, there, there's, there's a narrative battle and a manipulation of information and a propagandizing over the smallest actions in which it really pays for military information personnel themselves to be cognizant of these sorts of minute to minute uh, updates in the information environment and then the react accordingly. I think that's a fairly new phenomenon. Um, to go to General Ryan, um, and building off what Emerson just spoke about, talking about um, narrative warfare, propaganda, um, weaponizing information, where do you um, see what's new about what's going on today and what is warfare, sort of warfare as normal, as usual over the course of history? Um, because all of these things clearly have all, have always been a part of waging war. So what's what's the new thing about what um, commanders are experiencing? Oh, thanks, Kate. It's wonderful to uh, be here with you all today. Um, no, I, I think you're right. What we're seeing is, in some respects, a continuation of what has been uh, a historical part of human conflict ever since humans have sought to impose their will on each other. You know, war and, and competition is is an intricate balance of physical and, and moral forces. What's new and, and disruptive uh, is that the technologies of the 21st century have not only 
enhanced lethality at long distance, it's enhanced influence at long distance, and to be able to more precisely target and more discriminately target uh, individuals and groups for influence. Um, and it's now done in a way that really is historically unprecedented. I mean, you saw uh, some such as uh, the Nazis and others really master the art of propaganda through film and television in the, in the 30s and 40s. Um, I mean, what we're seeing now, as Tom Ridd explored wonderfully in his book, Active Measures and others, is this being taken to a whole new level. Uh, and it's a way I think democracies are still struggling to really, uh, not so much acknowledge, but to really find effective ways within their value systems to counter. Um, now thinking about, as you've just shifted it to countering um, these tactics, and it's a good segue uh, to my next question, which is, what's the process by which the United States and Australia have integrated the information domain and what's going on online and social media into tactics and operations and strategies? How has it made its way into training if it has yet? Um, Dennis, or actually, Commander Ryan, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, I, I guess uh, the first thing is that this starts from the top. Uh, it's not a military undertaking. It, it absolutely must be a national undertaking and any military involvement, particularly in, in democracies where the military is always subordinate to the, the elected civil authority, um, any approach to countering these kind of influence activities must start from the very top of your democratic system. Uh, and and I, I would be fair to say over the last few years, our country has had a little bit of experience uh, with being targeted by uh, at least one significant country uh, for a range of different coercive measures. Uh, and the response there has embraced a range of different uh, agencies and government organisations, including the military, but it has been led and integrated from the very top of our uh, elected system. And, and I think that integration and the fact that it has to be led uh, right from the very top of the democratic systems are keys to success in countering, uh, firstly, the influence and coercive activities of our competitors but also undertaking uh, activities of our own where we might seek to influence uh, foreign populations. Mm -hmm. And Emerson, do you want to speak to the US experience? Well, certainly. Um, so in late 2017, Secretary, then Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis uh, actually formally designated information as the uh, seventh domain of joint maneuver. Uh, which had all sorts of follow-on effects with uh, U.S. training and doctrine. It's also the fact that um, one reason that Peter Singer and I wrote uh, our book, Life War, was because of um, someone we knew who told us a fascinating story that in Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, which is a very large uh, training ground uh, in which... Uh, Pre previous decades was used to prepare the US military for the uh, trials and different dynamics that counterinsurgency entailed. Um, in, in Fort Louis Folk, Louisiana, there was a new sort of training layer where when uh, large exercises were being run, there were actually military contractors who would set up a fake internet and fake social media accounts, fake, fake blogs, a whole ecosystem and that it was uh, actually up to uh, military commanders to figure out how to allocate resources appropriately to monitor the information space concurrent with trying to pursue their objectives on the ground. The, the point being that uh, there needed to be a sort of reconceptualization where you, did, you didn't just think of um, the internet as uh, you know, a, a reactive space or um, something that, that maybe uh, intelligence uh, units in military headquarters were passively informing you about, that you had to understand that the, the internet and his online space was as much a, a part of the terrain as the um, land, sea, and air, that you had to constantly be monitoring it and to understand that any action that you took would reverberate through this digital space. And quite quickly, you would have uh, both a national audience and an international one. 
And I also think flowing from these sorts of training changes um, and formal doctrinal changes, there is an increasing understanding that um, like digital monitoring is and, and what happens online is also very much a force protection issue. When there's uh, disinformation spread in Latvia, for instance, that uh, a NATO soldier on deployment has been uh, implicated in a horrible crime, uh, that is part of, the inf of an information conflict between, say, uh, NATO and Russian proxies, but it also poses an immediate potential threat to uh, the personnel who are deployed in country. And I think we have come a long way in understanding that today. Um, you mentioning force protection and um, sort of the dangers of, of being online and being on social media reminds me of a current, a current problem, um, the spread of disinformation around the COVID vaccine, which uh, members of the armed services around the world are, are just as susceptible um, to that kind of disinformation campaign as a regular citizen. Um, how important is di digital literacy to, to training these days? And is it something that's been incorporated yet um, in militaries in the United States or in Australia or other partners? Um, well, it's certainly an important part of what we do. Um, and it's being incorporated now in a way that probably even five years ago, uh, we weren't as sophisticated or um, uh, deeply invested in. Uh, you know, like the United States, we do uh, quite, amount of, quite a bit of training where we, we focus on the, um, the space beneath the threshold of war being as, as consequential as that above the threshold. Um, and it's a mindset, and it's not just an individual mindset, it's an institutional one, but it's, it's a hard one to give the same kind of priority as the, the you know, the big domains of uh, land, sea and air, but I, I think we're getting there. Um, we do a lot of wargaming at our war college that focuses on these kind of issues, um, because one of the great trends in 21st century competition and conflict is we need to reappreciate uh, the speed of conflict. Uh, and I'm not just talking in the physical space with hypersonic weapons, the speed at which information can move. And, and there's an MIT study a few years showed the speed at which a lie can move globally is, is, is unprecedented. So armoring the minds of our people against uh, disinformation, but ensuring that uh, the conduct of influence is first and foremost in the minds of commanders and staffs and other national security practitioners. It, it, it's an ongoing concern. We've had hundreds of years of focusing on the kinetic, getting that rebalance right in doctrine, in training, in policy, in, in strategy making and execution is, I, I still think is, is an ongoing concern, um, uh, but we are seeing enough uh, in the last few years, particularly from China and Russia, that the challenge has become very clear. It's, it's no longer possible in a Western military to challenge that there's an issue here. It's very clear. And I think we've identified the problem now really, um, the differences between Western nations is the approach we're taking, not so much in recognizing that there's a there's a significant issue that we all face together. So it, it's tough to think through how to address this one because um, training in, trainers regarding the information environment have come a long way. Uh, you know, a, one now learns, for instance, that if you find an abandoned flash drive in a base parking lot, you shouldn't plug it into your computer. We, we know a lot more than we did, and there's a lot more cognizance, but there is, I think, uh, a sort of confusion with um, cyber hygiene, which is critically important, with this broader sort of information awareness and literacy. Um, it, it, there's also the fact that, that it, we learn how to better shield ourselves against cyber attacks. I think we've learned, as the rest of the, uh, the world's militaries have learned, that social media data can be used to provide uh, open source insights to our adversaries. So there, there's a bit more caution shown there. But to my knowledge, there really isn't much focus on information literacy, specifically in the military. And you see it reflected in things like the abysmally low vaccination rates since in the US military, um, uh, 
vaccination against COVID-19 is purely voluntary. And um, this is true of the active duty military. It's also true of veterans communities that they're often quite isolated from uh, society at large. Um, that certain narratives and uh, misinformation that spreads through like a closed Facebook community, for instance, or a, a Telegram chat, uh, or even certain corners of TikTok, um, that information can be very compelling in these groups. But if you're not part of these communities, you're not necessarily seeing it. And um, the, the, all, the sort of network and uh, filter bubble effects that we all struggle with as a society are, I think, amplified further when you're part of the armed services because you're going through such a unique experience and you're much more prone to believe information that's spread by people who are similarly part of that experience. That sense of camaraderie um, when you're talking about the sharing of misinformation can unfortunately work against you. One of the things I've seen, Kate, uh, is there's a trend with some uh, military people, uh, particularly military leaders, is to just decide not to participate in social media at all. I just don't think that's a very good response. Um, I think if you're going to understand modern influence, how information flows in societies and globally, you actually have to participate. It's You can't get literate in a lot of these issues unless you've jumped into the pool some would say cesspool at times of, of different forms of social media and networking. So, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is actually get people on uh, studying it, using it, understanding how human beings interact through social media. Um, just not using it isn't a sufficient or even a, a mature response, I don't think. It's interesting. There's a very similar uh, dynamic at play in the world of journalism, which is where I sort of live among editors of top newspapers. And there was an essay this week about how a lot of top editors at The Post, The Times, just decide also not to participate in on Twitter, online. Uh, they think it's kind of beneath or not the real world. And so then when one of their staff members gets attacked or trolled, the ecosystem in which that's happening, they don't fully understand. And so their response is limited for the same reason. So I think across you know, many domains, this is the decision to participate or not, or to decide to be cognizant of what's going on is so important. You have to be savvy in order to then, when, it, when the, the attack is on you, you understand uh, all the forces at play. Um, so it's very much a, a, an active debate in the journalism world as well. Um, and the same thing, like keeping reporters off Twitter, should you know soldiers be kept off Twitter? Should they be allowed to express their opinions? All these same, all these same issues. Um, I, I loved what you said earlier about um, General Ryan armoring the minds of our people. Um, I think that's such a, a crucial national security problem right now. And it, and it made me think about um, you know, whether the United States and other democracies are, are more susceptible because we do have a freedom of the press, we do have unrestricted access to social media, it's not restricted, it's not monitored, versus um, in autocracies where that can be the case. And how does this, you know, the fact that American minds are sort of less protected in a way than, um, than the minds of people living in, in autocratic countries, how does this, uh, implicate in the way we think about the problem um, and how you approach it as well. And I'll throw that well, out to both of you. Yeah, um, I mean, possibly um, the minds of people in democracies are, are less protected, but um, they're more open to the broadest array of potential uh, that humans uh, uh, can, can express. Um, you know, this is where I think uh, education and, you know, not just uh, uh, university education or military education, but you know, high school, primary school education is so important. I think that if our people uh, better understand uh, how our system works as a democracy, if they have a better understanding of their society, I think they're less um, less likely to believe some of the uh, things that you see uh, put out there by uh, the, the the autocratic nations. Uh, around the world. So I think education about your own society is a really important part 
of this, you know, armoring the minds of our people against some of these intrusive uh, influence campaigns that we're seeing from, from different countries. Um, you know, in, in a military specifically, um, I know that there are countries, I mean, the United Kingdom has a really good uh, literacy program when it comes to online behaviors. Um, we do some of it, uh, whether it's as good as that, I'm not sure, but, you know, the Brits, I think, have some really good uh, lessons for us. And a couple of the countries in uh, Europe also do so. NATO uh, has invested uh, a lot in understanding influence and, and the training and education requirements from it. So I think there's a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, I think democracies just have to be better sometimes, particularly the militaries are sharing its lessons from uh, a part of our profession that probably is a little more sensitive and at times people uh, don't always want to share their lessons in. Well, I, I think as a, as a democracy, um, we can't shut down the internet. Uh, we can't engage in disinformation and we shouldn't want to be able to do these things. Um, how the modern internet changes dynamics, I think, is that you, if you are thinking about it through a public communications challenge as a, a military communicator, you, you have to tell the truth and you have to be as candid as possible um, you know, uh, even when uh, an airstrike goes awry, uh, when there's collateral damage, the death of civilians, uh, horrific tragedies, if statements that are released that use, uh, you know, weasel words or which are indeterminative, um, which uh, leave questions hanging, uh, these things don't stand up very well to online scrutiny. And they're quickly um, taken advantage of by our adversaries who can also freely engage in disinformation and manipulation and falsehood. Um, I think our best chance is to be as candid as possible and to quickly acknowledge when errors are made. And in so doing to build a reputation for reliability, um, which unfortunately has been tested some uh, at least in the United States in recent years. Um, and and I, I think that will go a long way. It, it's also the fact that um, some of our best sort of um, online emissaries, if you're thinking about the armed forces, are not the, uh, the numerous um, uh, military commands and offices and, and branches um, and agencies that now have their own, say, dedicated Facebook page and Twitter account. It's uh, service members themselves. Um, they can best tell their stories. Um, they're, and th they can be powerful examples and positive um, forces of persuasion. The challenge, though, is being in a position where, you know, as, as a commander or someone in charge of uh, thousands of people and responsible for everything that goes wrong, um, for these people in charge to be willing to, um, uh, you know, give that much latitude to a junior subordinate and have them potentially make uh, statements of great strategic import. That's tough. Uh, that sort of... Um, uh, allocation of responsibility is not easy, I think, for anyone to do, much less in a military hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is a challenge, um, but it's, you know, I've, I've uh, commanded large organisations where I actually made it mandatory for my subordinates to be on social media and to use it. I didn't make it discretionary for lots of reasons, um, but transparency in the military organization of a democracy isn't discretionary. It's essential. And it's got to be a core part of how we do business. And as Emerson said, you know, bad news doesn't get better with time. Uh, and you'll always get found out. So fess up right from the start and move on. That's what a democratic system is supposed to be like. It, it always, it still perplexes me that we will allow our people to carry weapons that are capable of dealing the most awful destruction on other human beings, but we won't let them use two thumbs to put out a message. Um, and I find the tolerance and the mismatch in the tolerance of risk in some organisations between allowing people to be enormously violent, but not tweet 
something about what they might have done uh, is something that I think we're still kind of struggling with. Um, and it really comes down the tolerance to risk uh, of both politicians and senior military leaders in democratic systems. I think part of that uh, avoidance of risk at time is that we're still struggling to come to grips with this uh, democratization of information that's occurred in the last 20 years. Uh, I mean, our societies, I still think, are struggling with that. Uh, I think most uh, many political parties in democratic systems are still struggling with that. So what we're seeing in the military with uh, avoiding risk in the use of these kind of tools at times, I think is uh, more representative of um, the evolution that society is going through in coming to grips with this huge, uh, unprecedented historical democratization of information globally. And I, I think it should be said, um, just as an aside, that General Ryan is good, sort of famously good at Twitter. Um, that that's that's not always the case. I'm I'm thinking of uh, recent examples where, <clears throat> I think it was uh, uh, a U.S. Army brigade whose uh, official Twitter account just put out a, a photoshopped image of what looked like different uh, brigade elements, all. Um, sort of uh, being uh, uh, superheroes. They were superimposed over the uh, images of the popular show, The Boys. But the problem is The Boys is about evil superheroes. Mm -hmm. So they'd really Photoshop themselves over a, a image of a bunch of super villains. Yep. And the first question is, you know, why did you make that mistake? But that's not really, I mean, mistakes happen. The problem though, is that then there was this whole news cycle in which <laughs> whatever point was trying to be made was instead consumed by, um, you know, a sort of petty conflict, uh, conflict in, uh, you know, like military press, which didn't need to happen at all. I think of other examples where um, uh, you know, US strategic command uh, in charge of all of our, our nuclear weapons um, used to celebrate Talk Like a Pirate Day on Twitter. Now, that's something else where I, I just wonder, um, do I want the nuclear command to be talking like a pirate or to be participating in day-to-day -day Twitter stuff? Or would I prefer not to hear from publicly from US Strategic Command unless something very bad is going on? And that, that's where I think there's an, an important distinction between um, institutions, between these sorts of institutional accounts, which don't, in my view, don't always need to have public facing presences, um, versus individuals, individual uh, commanders or um, just service members who are comfortable having a public voice. And I think that element is crucial um, to remain connected to the civilian pop population and society at large. So interesting, Emerson, I remember, I think it's the line that closes out your book, but that you are what you share. And there might be a second part of that, but I, I still always think about that and that what you have to be so you have to be aware that don't retweet stuff you don't fully understand. Um, understand the context of whatever you're putting out there. Also, you don't have to comment on everything. You know, like you cannot tweet sometimes. Um, but all those lessons must be doubly important. You know, when you are representing the the U.S. military or the Australian military. Um, but added to that, you also have to think about how that the enemy is either gleaning information from you or can use what you're putting out there um, to, to use against you. How does that factor into sort of what um, military should think about as they approach their social media strategy? You know, we're talking about open sea, openness and transparency, but can that come back to bite you in some ways too? Oh, it, it could definitely come back to bite you. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> my my uh, colleagues at my center, uh, Digital Forensic Research Lab, are very good at finding trace bits of information and uh, little details and photographs and, and, and geolocating particular events, um, you know, working backward, finding uh, online the, the, the rosters, of, the full rosters of particular military units, figuring out deployment cycles. You don't need much uh, to uncover a whole lot of uh, unwanted revelations about uh, military activities. That is why, you know, in the uh, mid-2000s, the U.S. military briefly banned 
um, all social media use by uh, deployed personnel. That policy was eventually rolled back, and now I think it's been reinstated with a bit more nuance. But the, the fundamental tension here is that uh, you know, a lot of people in the military are right out of high school. They've grown up on these platforms. Um, their digital presence is a real part of their life. And to cut that off entirely um, is extremely difficult, all the more so if they want to be able to communicate with friends and family. But then on the other side are the obvious operational security challenges that you just alluded to. And I, I think I'm still undecided on this, and luckily I don't have to make a decision, but I, I do think on the net, it does make sense um, in, during deployments to limit or restrict entirely uh, service members' public presences, because it's such an obvious flank. It's such an obvious vulnerability. But before is that that uh, public presence was restricted. Uh, the US military was also restricting the easy way for service members to communicate with loved ones back home. We have to find ways to maintain that communication and to make it as, as, uh, as unencumbered as possible so that you can continue to speak to your family. Because we have that technology today. Um, you don't have to, you know, fight over one or two um, uh, landlines with poor call quality to speak to your family, even if you're in Afghanistan. And we should be able to embrace that technology as U.S. military and militaries in general. Yeah, I, I think we should at least be beyond the should we or should we not argument. Uh, I mean, I, I personally think that argument was settled quite some time ago, which it's how should we. Um, you know, I always compare uh, the use of social media uh, to the consumption of alcohol. It's not something you want to do all the time. It's not something you want to do on operations or while you're handling weapon systems and, and these kind of things. And it's something that we educate our people about the responsible consumption of. Um, so in military institutions, it's, I think it shouldn't be about should we or should we not. It's how do we responsibly use this technology? That's it's only been around for uh, you know 15, 16 years in a way that is aligned with the values of the countries we um, uh, represent and with the institutional values that we uh, all purport to possess. Uh, and it really, it, it has to be an integral part of training and education from day one, from when you come into an institution. It's not just a command responsibility. Uh, it's an individual responsibility and every individual needs to understand their um, responsibilities for responsible use of this technology. I'm going to um, bring in a question from one of our, our listeners, one of our watchers. Um, they said, you know, it's great to hear this conversation about information literacy and information liter and literacy, digital literacy training, but what can leaders do right now to uh, counter the harmful narratives that are, are, are being carried out in this moment. You know, the idea of being digital literacy is sort of more of a medium term plan, but as we're talking about disinformation around the COVID vaccine, for example, or whether it's election related, this is taking place right now, what can be done right now? Um, what about the official use of social media with better messaging techniques? What if official accounts simply amplified individual service members? Is that one way, I guess, to, to go about this? But what do you think about what can be done in the moment? If you're, you know, if you're a commander right now and you want um, to have some influence over this, what, what should you do? Um, nothing beats uh, good conversations between commanders and their people. Um, this is a leadership issue. I mean, um, we're talking about digital literacy, um, and technological literacy, but at heart, this is a very human leadership issue uh, where you have honest and open conversations with those you lead um, about what is within the bounds of acceptable behaviour, what are the, um, the campaigns that are running out there that are harmful to your individual interests or to those of your friends or to your unit or, or to your nation. Um, you know, you need conversations about, well, what happens when your friends get trolled? Um, you know, there, there are certain elements of the internet that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a sewer, to be quite frank. 
Um, and this is a, a really important leadership function to set the example for good behaviour, set the example for understanding the environment that is uh, influence and social media. And then they, in those honest conversations about what's right, what's wrong, um, what's acceptable in a military unit are really, really important. At heart, it, it does come, back, come down, like most things, to good human leadership of our people. So in a congressional hearing yesterday, General Mark Milley, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, made just an extraordinary statement after fairly sustained questioning um, regarding diversity measures and um, anti-racist awareness in the US military. And I can't possibly do his comments justice. Uh, I would encourage everyone to watch them if you haven't. It's just about a two minute clip, but it was a fairly extraordinary statement. Um, first, because uh, US military commanders and certainly not the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're not usually so candid when it comes to issues that, that uh, get close to uh, American politics. But not only was he candid, um, he was, he was angry, um, it seemed. And he, he tied um, these sorts of diversity measures he was under fire to, uh, under fire regarding, um, to, to American identity, to um, the society to which he was sworn to protect and defend. He made a very powerful, clearly candid and sincere argument um, for these sorts of measures. And in so doing, I think he set an example for the entire US military, for everyone under his command, the kind of example that you, you couldn't possibly get uh, no matter how many press releases you rolled out or um, you know, uh, commander's orders because everyone is going to watch that clip. And I think uh, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people will likely be swayed by it in some capacity or another. He showed I, I think a, a very good way that you navigate these challenges. One of the most powerful things in that statement was knowledge is good. You know, understanding the facts can be very powerful and not all facts are about you. You know, as he said, he read Marx and Lenin, doesn't mean he's a communist. Um, and, you know, he, he is a very well-educated and, and, and clever officer. And I've had the benefit of, of working with him in the Pentagon. Um, and what he was saying is that um, educating ourselves, not just about online threats, but a, but a whole range of things in the world beyond our own borders is an important part of who we are and an important part of our uh, contemporary and future success. Yeah, exactly that. And to go back to what you said earlier, armoring the minds of our people, his argument was read some books and <laughs> you don't have to adopt everything you read, but it will make you smarter and understand the world better. Um, and he also quite savvily created a viral moment, like you were saying, Emerson, um, which is so important these days too. It's one thing to have a powerful message, but if nobody watches it and he... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. He also created, I think, a viral a viral clip, which is so important these days too. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to zoom out a little bit and make sure we had time to discuss um, one of the broader themes of this conversation, which are what you know, the United States and and other democracies. Um, the idea that we have our hands tied behind our backs because of our own um, norms and and rule of law and you know. In that sense, it, this is asymmetric warfare. Other countries are willing to, to do wage campaigns, um, whether it's to undermine the effectiveness of a vaccine that's going to protect your population or whatever it is that the United States might not engage in. Um, so what does fighting back against disinformation look like if you're not going to use dif disinformation yourself? And is there any sort of place for an offensive strategy in this realm for democracies like the United States or Australia? Hmm. So that's a great question. And uh, when I was on book tour for Life War and speaking with military audiences, I, I think every time I would get a question um, quite sincerely, which was, 
you know, uh, after a long debate about election interference and Russian tools and techniques, the question would be, okay, like, do we do this? Um, they're doing this to us. Can't we just hit them back the same way? And the answer, of course, is no. Um, and we've touched on this a little bit before, but, you know, I said democracy is an open society. Um, we can't engage in outright falsehood, not just because it's wrong, but because it's counterproductive. The fact that the truth will eventually come out the fact that in a democratic state, um, the military and all aspects of the government are ultimately democratically accountable. And so you're doing ultimately more harm than good to your institutions if you engage in that kind of stuff. Um, so when we think about this, this difficult challenge of counter messaging, first thing is to understand that a lot of it has to come from the civilian government. There's a place for military communicators, but it's not the biggest place because um, a lot of counter messaging almost invariably uh, reaches our domestic population, like uh, um, and it's not appropriate in many contexts for uh, professional military communicators or information warfare officers to be uh, formulating messages that are reaching the local civilian population. Uh, in the United States, we've we've struggled with ways to. Um, sort of navigate this. We've given, for instance, a, a lot of money to the, the US State Department. We established this thing called the Global Engagement Center, which was taking largely uh, defense resources and reallocating them to a civilian agency that could better undertake that challenge. Um, and, and just one more point here, I mean, even within the military, um, there's great confusion over whose job this is. Is it public affairs officers? Are you going to wait a few days for um, you know a, a statement to be formulated and signed and, and uh, knocked up the chain of command? By then, the narrative has moved on. Is it folks on the ground? Uh, that might make the most sense, but then you have less accountability and transparency over who's doing the statement. Right now, virtually all these counter messaging functions lie with the U.S. Special Operations Community, um, like virtually every mission set in the U.S. military. But that's arguably counterproductive too. Um, what I think is, is, is not a whole solution, but I, I think what um, US military thinkers need to come to terms with is when you're talking about communications, um, it's everyone's job. And although you, you want to designate a few places that are actually delivering the public message, there's going to be some redundancy. There are going to be multiple people in multiple uh, departments and agencies with different equities who are working simultaneously on um, the difficult task of counter messaging. And that's not the most efficient allocation of resources, but it's necessary. And next to uh, you know half of an F-35, it really doesn't cost that much money uh, to have more folks on this critical challenge that in so many ways does inform uh, the pace of, and outcome of military operations. Um, you know, I think the challenge, I agree with everything Emerson said there. I, I think the challenge for military institutions, and sorry about the cat in the background, he's got the worst possible timing you can imagine. But um, the challenge for military institutions is um, the participation in these activities, which are a national activity, not so much a military one. Um, it's all up here. Um, whereas there's still large parts of the military that really like just the physical stuff that, you know, doesn't take as much thinking. That's a challenge. But to get back to uh, your original question, Kate, you know, how do we respond? I mean, I had this question, I've had this question a lot too. I, I had it at um, a US Navy War College where I spoke there um, and I spoke with Peter Singer. It was when he said, uh, you know, Taylor Swift is the Clausewitz of like war. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's a lot to that. Um, but the most powerful weapon that we have in democracies is legitimacy of our public institutions and governance. I mean, that, that is the most powerful weapon. That, that's our superpower. Um, we cannot act like our adversaries do, uh, you know, in a non-gender specific way. We're the good guys. And that comes with a series of obligations. Um, and it means things like telling the truth, it means things like uh, suppression of freedom of speech. Uh, you, you cannot do that. I mean, th these aren't discretionary things. So democratic norms, free speech, uh, allowing our people to express the full range of diverse views, 
and, um, and live more prosperous lives, I think are the superpowers of democracies. And um, they're the kind of things we need, really need to invest in if we're gonna be successful in this 21st century competition of ideas. I just need to sneak in one last question here. We only have a few minutes left, but um, a few of the of the folks who are listening have have reacted kind of strongly to the idea that soldiers should have sort of free access to social media. Um, you know, why do regular soldiers have a direct ability to leave info in a public space? Isn't there a policy about soldiers speaking with the media? You know, the idea that there should be a gatekeeper between. Um, your average service member and their access to the public. Um, and as a journalist on the other side, there, you know, there, there is a giant gatekeeper usually, um, ex, you know, outside of the, the world of social media. So um, try, kind of trying to tie in quickly what this sort of new, new world where soldiers are online, they are tweeting, um, what does it say quickly about civil military norms and, um, and maybe the disappearing line uh, between that? I think giving soldiers, sailors, uh, aviators a say is different to them commenting on every strategic or political issue of the day. I think the most authentic communicators in a military organisation, uh, you know, our soldiers, sailors, our airmen and women uh, who are doing things every day. And to be quite frank, most of the things they want to talk about online is not the latest national security policy or, or something like that, uh, but they're authentic communicators and we, we should be using, these are bright people. You know, we, we do recruit, train and educate uh, some amazing people from our societies. Why shouldn't we leverage the full range of their capabilities? Emerson, any final thoughts? Certainly. Um, yeah, first, just to clarify, uh, you don't want every service member uh, sharing their thoughts on ongoing operations. But the fact is, for a long time, I think the most followed uh, Instagram account associated with the Air Force, a US Air Force, was a young woman who just posted pictures of her working on planes and talking about what it was like to be in the military. And that kind of um, insight isn't the kind of thing that you can fabricate, you know, no matter how many public affairs officers you throw at it. If there are people who are willing to be that, who are able to be that candid connection, you use them because that's how you keep military as grounded as possible in the broader civilian society. And then um, two last thoughts here. The first on just this broader issue of social media use and civil military norms. Um, and thinking too back to uh, General Milley's statement yesterday, which is very much a political statement. Um, I think in an ideal you know, Huntingtonian, uh, you know, clear separation between civilian and soldier that General Milley wouldn't have made those statements. But I also think that the Huntingtonian model was never really as descriptive as people think of the relationship between the armed forces and broader uh, civilian population. The fact is that, um, you know, the military can't be entirely apart that um, it's not necessarily appropriate. Uh, it doesn't make sense for, um, say, all, all generals to forswear ever voting in an election. The fact is that they have always been a part of society and that uh, the immediacy of social media just makes that more apparent than ever. And one more thought here is that um, in the 90s, there was this talk of, uh, you know, uh, of three block wars, of the strategic corporal, of the idea that anyone, um, any enlisted service member through their actions could, in the modern information environment, um, their actions could sort of reverberate and echo and um, affect on a strategic level the pace of operations. What I think we are now beginning to grapple with, but are not, don't yet have a great answer to is, we still have the strategic corporal in effect, but we now have to understand that the, the actions taken by this enlisted service member, even if they do everything right, can still be decontextualized, can still be bundled into disinformation campaigns and used by our adversaries, ways we don't anticipate. So it's no longer just enough to even, even be fully cognizant of your strategic impact when you're on the ground conducting operations. You also have to understand, even if you do everything right, there are adversaries out there who are going to do everything in their power 
um, to make it look like you did something wrong. And we need the capability to be able to fight back in those situations. Well, that is a great note to end on. And um, I want to thank you both so much for joining me. And we'll kick it back, I think, to the, to the studio. Thank you both.